Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Wurzelbacher, the director of the Respect Life Office for the Arts Diocese of Cincinnati, and this is our video podcast series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month, we discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena. We'll hear a personal story from someone deeply affected by that issue, and finally, we'll share ways that you can get involved. This month, we're going to talk about the effects of technology and media on family life, and especially how to utilize it in your families while keeping your kids safe. As always, we have a special guest. Will you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Bob. My name is Rod Dunlap, and I am the coordinator for the Anti-Pornography Initiative with the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. I've been in this position since last August and have found it to be very fruitful, been very challenging at times, but it's a position that is very much needed, I believe, in addressing just the harmful effects of pornography and we're going to talk about other damaging things that could be out there on the on the internet as well. So the anti-pornography initiative, you're right, that is a big deal. And we'll talk about some of that in addition to other things. Why don't you give us real quick about your whole background in addition to your current position? So as far as my educational background, I, you know, I have my master's in religious studies and I just currently graduated in May with my master's in marriage and family therapy. And I'm taking my licensing exam coming up here in July to be licensed marriage and family therapists in the state of Ohio. I am married. I have actually nine children, two in heaven, six here at home, and one coming in August. So I have my hands full. So I'm very busy with that as well. Ron, I didn't know you were that close to being licensed officially in the state of Ohio with your marriage and family therapist. That is exciting. It's a journey I started five years ago. I felt the Lord calling me to this area to provide healing to families and individuals who are struggling with any sort of mental health issues. I just took one class at a time. I was growing a fam- my own family. So I literally told the Lord, said, look, you provide me the time to do it and I'm going to do it. And so I finally graduated just a few weeks ago, looking forward to taking my exam and becoming officially licensed in the state of Ohio and looking forward to whatever next adventure is out there for me. Rod, let's get to the topic at hand. So technology, social media, what you can do with your handheld phone, right? All of this has grown exponentially in the past 10 years, even, I would say. So some of it's great. Some of it's actually kind of dangerous, especially for children. So can we start with maybe some of the great things that we can do for families and kids of what has happened in the past 10 years? The whole smartphone really changed the trajectory of our society, I think. And there's so much more access and availability to good Catholic content. You could do like the daily readings and there's so many like prayer apps now that are out there. So many helpful apps that people can use to feel more connected to Christ through their phone. Our phones are not just the only form of technology that's really evolved, but also, you know, computers. And now we have smart watches and the advancement with all these different streaming channels that people can get on their televisions now. Technology has really evolved. It has evolved really quickly. And I think sometimes we do need to take a time out and go, wait a minute, you know, just because it's out there does not mean it's good for us. Okay. So there are a lot of good things. Uh, like I said, there are, there are various programs you can watch on these streaming channels, such as the, the new series, The Chosen. I don't know if you've, you've seen that at all. but um, Yeah, very, very well done. So as, as with all things, you know, God can find ways to bring goodness out of it. As a parent myself, I find just a smartphone to be very helpful as far as like a kid asked me a question, you know, I could pull up my phone and go, okay, what is the answer to this question? Sometimes we'll be driving in our van. We'll have, my wife will have her phone plugged into the speakers in the van and we'll be, she'll, she'll play like the rosary on YouTube or something and we'll pray the rosary together. There are a lot of great things that have come out of this technology in the last 10 years. I will also say that there are many cautions that need to be taken when using this technology. And I think we've seen people abuse this technology and use it for wrong reasons. As parents, we have to be cautious, really cautious when it comes to our children having access to this technology because it could be life-changing. 
for the better or for the worse. I don't know how much we need to go on about specifics here, but there might be some parents of young kids or parents of uh, teenagers are moving beyond some of the obvious, perhaps kid-friendly things. And they're starting to get their kids out there, exposed to different things that are on social media or on television even. What are some of these dangers that we need to be aware of that we might not be aware of as our kids are getting older and start getting exposed to more things that they can easily find online? It's a great question. And the list is really long, unfortunately, <laughs> of, the, of yeah. the dangers that are out there. First of all, one of the big topics, obviously, that a lot of parents have to understand and realize is that children can get access to a smartphone or a teenager can get access to it. And when they're online, when they're able to connect to a browser, they're able to get to anything on the internet. There are things on the internet that are very dangerous and very damaging. One of those being pornography. Right. It's one of the biggest online industries in the, in the world. The amount of money that this industry pulls in is astronomical. But also there's a lot of free sites and it's just, you can go anywhere now and pull it up. I know we were talking earlier about Jason Everett. He, I think he coined this phrase that the cell phone is called porn in a pocket. Literally you carry around a smartphone and you, you're, you're two clicks away from looking at pornography. As the coordinator for anti-pornography, I work with men one-on-one -on -one who are addicted to pornography, and I've seen the damage that it's done to them. When they, and many of them started using when they were younger, when they were teenagers, when they, you know, they were first exposed to this. And so the smartphone, in a way, has really affected an entire generation of young people now, young adults, because they've had such complete access to all of this stuff on the internet. So the pornography damages the brain long-term. I could really go on and on about pornography, but I, I do want to touch on some of the other dangers there are on, on cell phone use. What's really interesting, Bob, is some of the guys that I've worked with who are addicted to pornography, they realize through our meetings that they are actually addicted to their technology to their cell phone, to their computer. They realize that they're the type of person that's out there and they're just checking their phone every five minutes just for no reason or getting, you know, getting online for no reason. I've seen that a lot in society where you're waiting in line at the checkout line at the grocery store. And now people like feel like if they have a phone, they always have to be looking at it instead of maybe talking to another person. Talking to the person in line. I really try to be so aware of that. If the phone rings when I'm in, because I do like to talk to the person, mm -hmm. you know, right there at the center, but it's it's happened that somebody has called me while I'm in line. Oh yeah. And I'll take the call mm -hmm. and I'm like, I am so sorry. I'm on the phone when I'm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't check sports scores or something while I'm. Sure, <laughs> while I'm sure, exactly. Yeah, over. yeah. And I think a lot of people do that. Or I've seen people in line, like watching movies on their phone. Wow. Like they can't wait until they get home to watch a movie. <laughs> so I think, I think another damaging thing that we've seen from this technology is that it's, especially with the smartphone, it's really taken us away from each other as human beings, just the, the human interaction. Back to the harmful effects that it has on children. I know my wife and I have had our kids multiple times say to us, mommy, daddy, can you put your phones away and do something with us? And <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, I, I think we're all, we're all as guilty of this, but it's something to be aware of that our children are seeing us doing this and therefore they're going to want a phone like as soon as possible, because obviously if mommy and daddy are on this thing, like they, they're going to want this. What that does to a family is that the child is seeking attention and wants to spend time with his or her mom and dad and mom or dad's on the phone texting or whatever. And so I know over Lent, that was one of my things that I was trying to give up was like, put the phone down when I'm around the kids or when I'm, when I'm at home until the kids go to bed and then I can take care of whatever I need to take care of. So yeah. that's something that we need to be aware of as adults. But another thing too, Bob, I'll add in here real quick is that I read this great article one time about how when young children, we're talking like two and three year olds okay. can get access to a cell phone and they'll just start scrolling through and pressing buttons because they have no idea what they're doing. But what studies have shown is it actually changes the chemical process in a child's brain. It gives them this sense of control of, I can flip through and press buttons and move all this stuff around. And therefore a child will grow up thinking they have to be in control of everything. And when they're not, 
they really lose it and throw fits. And, and I have personally seen that as well in my own family. My wife will leave her phone laying around. And I remember a few years ago, my son was two and we currently have a two-year-old right now and they will would grab it and just start. They don't even know what they're looking for. They're just hitting buttons and stuff. But it's the idea of them having something physically in their hand and being in control of what is going on. We still see it now when we take it away from our two-year-old. He loses it. I mean, he absolutely loses it. So they can become addicted to just that power, even as a two-year-old. So it's important as parents that we recognize that what we're allowing our kids to get a hold of, even at a very young age, can be very detrimental to them. Yeah, that's kind of two things we could talk about. The first part that I wanted to talk about is right is some maybe some specific tips, and maybe some of these things would be age related. How do you keep yourselves and your children safe? Uh, the other side of that same coin would be even if the material is safe, right? How much just use of technology in of itself is even safe? Let's talk about how to protect ourselves first. So okay. there's a lot of different apps that you can download or, or systems that you can download to protect your eyes from seeing inappropriate images and things like that. For teens and adults, we, you know, we, they can go to Covenant Eyes for a program that will help hold someone accountable to what they're looking at, prevent them from going on inappropriate sites. Is that something where you assign somebody to be to know everywhere you visited and then that person yes. can talk to you about it? Yeah, or? so Covenant Eyes, I like it as a protection because what it does is it does protect you from going to certain sites and doing certain things on your cell phone. But also, if you happen to find ways around it, which a lot of kids nowadays are so tech savvy, they're able to find ways around it. You have an accountability partner that if you actually go on and view inappropriate stuff, an email gets sent to your accountability partner and they get to see what you were looking at. So then they're going to contact you the next day and say, Hey, what are you doing? Let's talk about this. You know, so I like that for like teenagers, adults. I, I've even recommended to adults, you know, those struggling with pornography. Another good one that I know of is Net Nanny. That's a good filtering device that they can put on their phone. So it filters out things as well, not allowing children to view certain things. And I just heard about this one the other day. Apparently, Disney has a new one out called Disney Circle. But I heard that's really good for younger kids as younger kids are getting more exposed by using tablets that have this protection on that as well. And, you know, Bob, I'll be honest with you. In my opinion, the safest thing that a parent can do for their kids is do not give them a device. If your kid needs a phone, I know for a fact that there are phones still made without Internet access. I've seen the damage that that stuff on the internet has done to people. And for me, it's like, this is not worth it. It's not even worth, let's try to put this blocker on or that. My number one thing would say would be, don't give your kid a smartphone. I mean, I know it sounds radical because everyone has one, but I'm seeing kids like third and fourth graders now have smartphones. Right. We're basically giving third and fourth graders access to the entire internet. There are phones out there where you can text where you can still communicate with other people, where you can still call, but you don't have access to the internet. And that's the best way to go. All right. So, Rod, do you have an opinion on, they start begging for it in fourth grade. At what age do you think, okay, I would consider a filtered smartphone? I don't know if there's an exact age. I think it's more of a maturity level. I think as parents, we need to not give age a, a certain, oh, well, you're 16. Now you can have this. I think it's better as a parent to look at it as, is my child mature enough? Now, yeah, I would definitely say my child turns a certain age and they're begging for it. I would have the conversation with my wife and then we would talk about what they would be allowed to have and then what filters and blockers we would put in place on there. In a way, it's protecting our children. Just like as those of us with small kids, like I have car seats in my car. Okay. Why are they there? To protect my child in case I get into an accident. Putting filters on a phone or pulling a tablet away or telling them you can't have a phone, honestly, we're protecting them from the damage that they can do to literally wreck their lives at a young age and through adulthood. So 
we have to look at it that way. It's like we're protecting them. We're not trying to be as rigid parents, but we're protecting them just like we would anything else. So you mentioned specifically Covenant Eyes, more for teens and older, even adults, Net Nanny, even Disney Circle. What about that other side of the coin? Just in general, like don't let your kid watch more than this amount of TV, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I know that what happens is Typically on Friday night, we watch a family movie. I used to be very, okay, I've seen this movie. I know that I can watch it. And now it's more like, you know, they're older, just kind of scrolling through. It's not that we watch our movies or anything, but scrolling through, okay, this like this could be okay. And you start watching it and I'm like, uh, maybe not. You can't trust PG. What I do, not just for myself, but for my children, I go to IMBD, a secular website that reviews movies and TV shows. But the really cool thing is, is if, if you search a certain movie or a TV show, there's actually a parent guide on there and you can right. click on it and it really goes into detail. Like it grades every sort of topic that could be an issue. So it will have like sex slash nudity and then it'll grade it and it'll say violence, grade it, drug use, and it grades right. it. Language. And it, right. and if, yeah, yes, language. Yes, thank you. And if you go on it and click it, It will actually describe the scenes so that you can make a good judgment yourself as to whether or not, A, this is appropriate for me, or B, is this appropriate for my kids? And so I have found that to be the best. I know there's other family sites out there that you can go and they review stuff ahead of time, but I've not found one as extensive as just IMBD, which is so interesting because it is a secular website. If my wife and I are going to watch a movie or TV show, I go on there ahead of time because I want my eyes to be pure still. I don't want stuff to pop up where I'm like, oh my gosh, like we shouldn't be watching. I wish I didn't see that, right? For our listeners, if you even Google parent guide, name of the movie, I think that's the first thing that comes up. I know I've kind of gotten away from your question there, but as far as time, there are ways to actually restrict time on technology. Now, I know on iPhones and on some smart TVs, you can actually set a time that'll shut it off at a certain time. So no matter what your child is watching or no matter what you're watching, when that timer goes off, it shuts your TV off. I know that you can also set them on computers as well. And then when the timer goes off, you're done. Or you can always use just the old-fashioned egg timer, right? Right. (laughs) Just like, (laughs) just set a timer. Another form of technology we haven't talked about is just like Alexa with Amazon or Google Home. You know, they can talk to you and you talk to them and have them do stuff. We found those to be very beneficial as far as like keeping time. You just say, hey, Google, can you set a a four-minute timer? Because with so many kids at home, little kids, it's like our hands are always full. So we don't have time to like, you know, get the old egg timer out. And so... (laughs) So that's been beneficial as well. <laughs> that's so funny. It's true though. I don't have time to get the egg timer out and turn that, <laughs> turn that knob. Exactly. We have that. We have the home computer, which is a laptop that the kids have to log into and they have a certain amount of time, right? Mm-hmm. But then when that goes off and they're done with that, they still got the television, right? That doesn't mm-hmm. have a timer on it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how yeah. much you can always notice that. And then they also, I think there's some things, I forget what, sometimes because they want to talk to a friend, perhaps, particularly mm-hmm. in the pandemic. And they need my iPad, for example, to do that. And then once they have it, then they might be doing something else with it. I think that if we give a child a device, any kind of device that's not like protected or anything, you know, we want to make sure that, okay, you can have it, but you got to sit in the same room as mom or dad. And then as parents, you can always go on the device and look at the history. Because I don't think a lot of kids, a lot of younger kids are smart enough yet to know there's a history thing on there. So right. you can do that as well. One of the things I like to do, Bob, as a parent is like, if our kids are out all day playing or socializing or doing stuff with others, and at night they want to watch a few shows before they go to bed, I have no problem with that because they spent the majority of their day playing. As a parent, you kind of have to use your parenting skills and, and look at it and say, well, has my child been on this thing all day? And if so, let's turn it off and let's play outside. If it's raining, let's play a board game or something like that, right? You have to juggle that. I used to be a youth minister and these teenagers would tell me like they would play video games for eight to 10 hours straight a night. And there's no other way to say anything. That's the parent not stepping in and doing anything. I'm not here to like 
point fingers and place blame, but sometimes we got we got to call each other out in a, a beautiful, loving way. And they got to understand, like, you can't allow your child to play eight to 10 hours. These are just things that teenagers can binge on. And then they pick up this binging mentality, which can carry over to other parts of their lives. When Netflix first came out, I was teaching at an all girls high school and the girls all had iPads that they had from the school and they would come in and I taught religion like first thing in the morning and they would tell me, they say, Mr. Dunlap, I got like two hours of sleep last night because I was binge watching Netflix until five or six o'clock in the morning. As parents, we're not doing anything about it. And so that can really be a harmful effect, this whole binging thing that can carry over. So that's the extreme measure, I think, of using technology. But there's a middle ground. I think as parents, we kind of have to see what our family structure looks like and what our days look like with our kids as far as limiting them to how much they can and can't use. I would say a teenager, if they're doing schoolwork and stuff, they may need to be on the computer for a lot of different things. So that's different. But anyone younger than a teenager and wanting to be on a computer for two hours, I would question why and is that necessary? So I think parents kind of have to have that conversation between themselves and say, well, what does my family look like here? And what does my situation look like? Because it may look different than the parents across the street. There's not like a silver bullet answer to that question. Right. I don't know if you had kind of a rule of thumb in general for entertainment purposes, right? At this age, no more than an hour a day. At this age, no more than 90 minutes. Any kind yeah. of a rule of thumb people have, or you just it really, you just have to be the parent. I would say you really have to be the parent, but what you can do is create the rule of thumb in your home. We get this data and we're like, oh, well, this is what I should do. No more than this or less than this. And it's like, well, just because there's data suggesting, does it, does that mean it's going to work for your family? Right. I don't know. I think we kind of have to understand if someone under the age of 12 is on the computer for more than two hours straight or two hours in a day, I as a parent would say, what, what is the necessity to do that? You know, what we do in our house too, is we combine like technology use with chores and behaviors. If you are going to do these chores and clean up this, then you have earned yourself a half hour on the tablet, right? And they know that. If you have a child who likes to do that stuff and they're not looking at inappropriate stuff, how can you use that in a way that will be positive encouragement for your child to pick up their room or things like that. That's all great advice. I don't know how much we can talk about this, but I have noticed what used to be, I'll say, the most family-friendly shows. Now it's more and more the case that the exposure to this character has two dads, right? Or this character even is transgender, you know, cartoons, this kind of a thing. Do you just talk about it with your kids because that's where the world is? Or do you try to keep your kids from even watching cartoons that suggest that that should be normalized? My kids are all, a seven-year-old is my oldest, so they're all pretty young still. Right. My wife and I have made the decision to just steer clear of any shows like that that would provide a image of the family that God did not have in mind when right. he created Adam and Eve and, and what the family structure, would, the family unit would look like. And I think that's just the way we feel, especially with younger kids, we want them to see what God had in plan for what a family should look like and not to have them confused. But I understand your question because it's, it's becoming more and more out there. There are some Disney shows now that have that. And there's things on TV. I just saw a commercial last night with two dads and they actually showed them near the end of the commercial lying in bed, going to sleep together. And I was even like shocked at that. We want to, as they're younger, protect them from that. But as they get a little bit older, I feel like with our seven-year-old, we have already begun the conversations about that because she'll start asking, why does that person have two dads? Why does that person have two moms? So my wife and I have begun having those conversations and we explained to her that these are choices that these people have made. And that we still respect them and show love for them. But it, it is this is all stuff that parents need to talk to their kids about. Once again, Bob, this whole idea of technology, why we're doing this podcast, 
a lot of responsibility needs to come upon the parent. We got to be better. We've all got to be better. I'm not just saying other people, I'm saying you and I, we all got to be better as parents. But the thing is, we got to be aware of what's out there and be ready for it. We can't wait until it just shows up on our screen. And then we're like, oh my gosh, what was that scene? Or, oh man, should my kid be watching? It's too late. They've already saw it. Right. You know? So, <laughs> so we got to be proactive. We have to look online ahead of time. There might be a show or a show with a really good message that kids could really take. And maybe in that show, there is a word that we don't want our kids to learn or this. Then we talk to our kids about it. We process it with them, you know, and I think that's something that as parents, we need to do more of. We can only protect our kids for so long, but if we're able to lay a solid moral, ethical foundation inside of them, then we're going to feel better as parents when they start using all of this technology and when they go out into the real world. That's kind of our mindset is we're trying to do the best that we can of laying the foundation. The house is not built on sand. So when the storm comes, as, as we learn in scripture, it doesn't blow away, but it's built on, on solid rock. And, and that our kids, when they do encounter things that may be not appropriate or what they're used to growing up, they will have the skills and the tools to, to turn away from certain things or to say no to certain things. I really just want to reinforce the whole idea of that we're protecting our children just like we would from a car accident or someone breaking into our home. We have to realize like their life is really on the line and their soul is on the line when we allow them to use technology without any sort of supervision or protection. All right. Well, thanks for talking with us today about media and technology and how to protect our kids and even ourselves, not only from some of the harmful things we can find out there, but even from the amount of time that we might be spending so that we don't get addicted to technology mm -hmm. in the first place. So thanks for spending time with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Bob. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for tuning in on this episode of our Being Pro-Life series. Head to the website to view the more resources talked about in this episode at www.catholicaoc.org slash Thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to being with you next time.